وأقولوا في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى Today we're going to be starting a five-day seminar where we'll be speaking about or explaining the kitab بلوغ المرام من أدلة الأحكام and we'll be explaining this book the chapter will be كتاب الحج the chapter of Hajj Before we go into the kitab And before Salatul Maghrib, we will do the biography of the book. So we know who wrote this book. And so when we hear his statements, or when we hear his grading of the hadith, we'll appreciate him. Because we know who he is. Rahimahullah. This book, Bulughul Maram, Min Adilat al Ahkam, is written by Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Hajar wrote it. So first point. Those of you who are taking notes, first point. The author of this book, his kunya, his nickname, is Shihabuddin. Is Shihabuddin. And his laqab, and laqab means when you're named after a child or a Whether it be your child or whether it be another person's child or whether it be no child, but you just take the kunya, uh, take the kunya na'am. So kunya is when you're named after a child and laqa means nickname. That was a mistake I did. So the sheikh's laqa is Shihabuddin and his kunya is Abu al-Fadl. Abu al-Fadl. And his name is Ahmed. His name is Ahmed. Ibn Ali ibn Muhammad, Ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Muhammad, Ibn Hajar al Kinani al Asqalani al Shafi'i. All you need to know is that his name is Ahmed ibn Ali. Ahmed ibn Ahmed ibn Ali. That is what his name. His name is Ahmed and his father's name is Ali. He's really well known as Al Asqalani. He's really known as Al Asqalani. And he is of the Shafi'i Madhab. The Madhab which he ascribes to is the Shafi'i Madhab. And we know that there are four Madhabs. The first one of them is Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And the second one is Al-Imam Malik Ibn Anas Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And the third one is Al-Imam Muhammad Ibn Idris Al-Shafi'i. And the fourth one is Al-Imam Muhammad ibn, uh, Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. Those are the four. They are called Al-Aymat al arbaa the four Imams. And the world, that we're in, the world that we're in generally, the overwhelming majority of people, they ascribe to one of these four schools in their fiqh. The largest in number being the Hanafi Madhab. But the author here is of the Shafi'i Madhab. He was born in the month Shahru Sha'ban. He was born Sha'ban ibn Hajar. Sanata Thalathin wa Sab'ina wa Sab'imi'ah. When the year was 773. That's when he was born. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. 773. And he was born, as they say, ala shati'i Nil, shati'i Nil Misra, the river Nile. That's where he was born in that area. So he was born in Egypt, old Egypt. Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he grew up as an orphan. His father died 
and he was only four years of age when his father passed away and his mother had already died before that his mother died before his father <clears throat> he entered into the kutab the kutab is where the child learns how to read how to write it's like a nursery the child learns manners and etiquettes he entered there when he was five years old and he finished the Quran he was nine years of age he was nine years old when he finished the Quran and he used to lead Salat al-Taraweeh in the Haram Rahimahullah when he was only 12 years of age he was 12 years old and they gave him the Imamat al-Haram the Kaaba he used to lead it at the age of 12 and the person who appointed him to lead in the Haram was Zakiyuddin Al-Kharubi Rahimahullah He appointed him He said let him lead And you have to understand That a Kaaba For you to be given it To lead it Means that you hold A great amount of Quranic knowledge And also you have What the scholars used to look at a lot The way that the person carries himself They didn't just look at Gathering information But they looked at how the person carried themselves. So he, they, the scholars of that time saw Ibn Hajar at the age of 12 fit enough to lead the Muslims in the Haram. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Also, you have to keep in mind at that time there were scholars. The people of knowledge were large in the people who were alive at that time. The ilm was high at that time. At the age of 12, he was permitted to lead. The Shaykh Rahimahullah Ibn Hajar, he had this burning desire inside him after have memorized in the Quran, and I want you to all underline that. After have memorized in the Quran, brothers and sisters, I will be deceiving you if I make you feel like you can get somewhere in this religion and you can become a scholar without having to memorize the Quran. Rather, some of the scholars they said seeking knowledge starts after memorizing the Quran. In other words, memorizing the Quran is not specific for a person who wants to embark on the path of attaining knowledge. No. It's also for what? The ordinary Muslim, the taxi driver who wants to drive. I was amazed because the taxi driver that brought me now to the masjid was a hafid bi kitabillahi azza wa jalla. Hafid. And that's how it should be. The people, everyone have to memorize the Quran. That should be normal amongst the Muslims in order this religion to be preserved through the memory of the people. So after I've memorized the Quran, the Shaykh, he memorized these small little texts, small little books that were written. And these small little texts that we're referring to is Qutub sunnah He memorized Qutub sunnah From those books I'm referring to as well is Umdatul Ahkam that we taught Qubayla Ramadan before the month of Ramadan we taught another book in the chapter of fasting written by another great Imam called Abdul Ghani Ibn Abdul Wahid Al Maqdisi Hafid ibn Hajar memorized that book and he memorized Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih al Muslim he memorized Kutub al Sitta and he memorized the Ajza and they said he memorized Mu'jam al Tabarani Al Kubra Al Kabir and Al Awsat and Al Sagir, he memorized all that. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. By the age of 20, Faqa Akranu fi Funul al Adabi. But keeping in mind, at the age of 20, he passed his peers. Ibn Hajar, at the age of 20, he passed his peers. And he was, at that moment, at the age of 20, he still hasn't memorized the books of Hadith. The burning desire for the knowledge of Hadith came later. At this moment, he hasn't memorized the books of hadith, he's going to memorize it later. But he memorized the Arabic poetry. He was deep in the Arabic language. That he used to write his own poetry. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And so writing poetry became a habit for him. It was an ordinary thing. He would write it whenever he wished and whenever he wanted. Rather, constructing a paragraph and writing a poetry became the same for him. 
But after he reached the age of 20, his hunger and desire for the Arabic literature, he realized it's not getting anywhere. And his hunger was still there. And so he said, what can I do? And so Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, with his ultimate wisdom, he directed Ibn Hajar towards Ulumu Sunnah, the books of Hadith. And then he gave his heart to it. He turned his heart and his mind towards the hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the prophet the prophetic traditions. Sama'an wa qira'atan wa musharakatan. He would listen to it. He would read it. He would participate in the circles of knowledge where it was taught. Once he gained the knowledge of the people of his land, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he traveled. That was the way of the scholars. That they would first of all take the knowledge from their city and their town. And once they've taken that on board, they will, they will think about traveling to the neighboring land, to their neighboring countries, and then further and further. So he traveled. Why? To attain knowledge. And to increase in the number of people he hears from, and to increase his numbers, his shuyukhs. So he went to Yemen, and he went to Sham, and he went to Hijaz, and he took from Mashahir al Ulama, the prominent scholars of that time. Ibn Hajar, his teachers in which he heard from, Ijazatan wa Ifadatan, in terms of Ijazat, certification, permission, verbal oral permission and also written permission that he has attained rahimahullah it said that it's 500 teachers rahimahullah ta'ala and this was in all of the sciences of the religion especially the sciences that he was deep in and he was grounded is was al-fiqh wal hadith he was grounded in hadith and fiqh from the well-known teachers is Ibn al-Mulaqin rahimahullah Ibn al-Mulaqin who died the year 804 Hijriya is from one of the prominent teachers of Ibn Hajar rahimahullah Sarajuddin al-Bulqaini and al-Bulqini both ways it said and he is the first person Sarajuddin al-Bulqaini and Sarajuddin al-Bulqini was the first person he was the first person to give Ibn Hajar the permission to go and teach. Sarajuddin al Bulqini. He said, Go and teach. You have the rights to teach. So he took it from his teacher. One of the teachers that he took from was Abu al Fadl al Iraqi, the author of the thousand lines in the science of hadith. Zainuddin al Iraqi was his teacher, Ibn Hajar. And Zainuddin al-Iraqi, after having seen Ibn Hajar, his memory, his comprehension, and his understanding, he couldn't hold himself but to refer to him as Al-Hafidh. A title that little attained it in the course of their life. Al-Hafidh. He attained that title. A person whose Hafidh is a person who what he knows from hadith and the hadith that he has memorized in comparison to that which he hasn't memorized, it's more. He's memorized more hadith than what he hasn't. Al-Hafidh, he attained that title. It wasn't given to him by his students and his friends and his colleagues. It was given to him by a scholar of his and a teacher of his. He also produced prominent students. Ibn Hajar, he produced great students. And from those students is al biqai From his students is Zakariya al-Ansari. From his student is, students is Ibn Qadi al-Shubha. Shubha, sorry. Ibn Qadi al-Shubha. From his students is Ibn Fahd al-Makki. From his students is, and the most prominent one is, the most well-known one is Shamsuddin al-Sakhawi rahimahullah, al-Imam al-Sakhawi. Sakhawi is one of the most known uh, students of, no, Sakhawi is a student of you know, Zainuddin al-Iraqi, sorry. Sakhawi is the student of Zainuddin al-Iraqi, sorry. 
Lakin, they said, one of the people that met Ibn Hajar as a young kid was Jalaluddin al Suyuti. Suyuti was young, but he entered onto Ibn Hajar, meaning he came to the masjid while Ibn Hajar was doing a dars. And they said he was either six or seven. Suyuti, rahimahullah, because Ibn Hajar was in what? He was in Egypt, as we mentioned at the beginning. And so he met him, and he died in Egypt, uh, Ibn Hajar. He has many books that he has written, Ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar has written many books. From those books that he has written is Fathul Bari, Bisharh Sahih al Bukhari. That is the explanation of Sahih al Bukhari. And the scholars, they said this is the best book he has ever written. Muhammad ibn Ali Shawkani, Muhammad ibn Ali al Shawkani, they came to him and they asked him, why don't you place an explanation on Sahih al-Bukhari? Why don't you do an explanation on Sahih al-Bukhari? And then he said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijra after fatah. That, that's a hadith of the Prophet, right? The Messenger said this in what context? The Messenger said it in the context of after Mecca was conquered and it was opened by the Muslims, no one's going to do hijra from Mecca, right? No one's going to migrate from Mecca. Ibn Hajar's kitab is called what? On Bukhari. It's called Fath al-Bari. Shawkani said, La hijrata ba'd al-Fath. The Fath he's referring to here is what? Fath al-Bari. bari we don't do hijra from Fath al-Bari. Meaning we will not explain Sahih al-Bukhari. We will allow the explanation of Ibn Hajar to be benefited from. Because of how great it is. وَلِذَلِكَ there is no explanation ever written on Sahih al-Bukhari better than Ibn Hajar's explanation on Sahih al-Bukhari, Fath al-Bari. Profound, amazing, unprecedented. Rahimahullah ta'ala. He also writ other great books like تهذيب التهذيب لسان الميزان التلخيص الحبير الدرر الكامنة تغليق التعليق إنباء الغمر بأنباء العمر Many books, all which we can talk about it for weeks, which each book is and why he wrote it and how he wrote it. And itself is a science, but we won't go into that. The book that he wrote that concerns us is the one that we're going to be studying today, Bulughul Maram Min Adillat Al Ahkam. This book, Bulughul Maram, um, and that's what concerns you, and that's what you need to know, is a book that brings hadiths. It's a hadith book. Bulugul Maram is what? It's a, it's a hadith book. But we will know that the hadith books that are written are different types. There are some hadith books that speak about heart softening, fadailul a'mal, righteous actions, like Riyadhu Salihin. Riyadhu Salihin is like fadailul a'mal. Are we all together, brothers? It talks about mu'amalat and how to deal with the Muslims and how you need to connect yourself with Allah and things like that. Like the kitab at targhib wa tarheeb al-imam al mundiri It's the same. It's heart softening and etc. So some hadith books, the scholars would only place in that book heart softening hadiths. Hadith that will touch your heart. And some scholars... They write hadith books that are not restricted to anything, but it's any and everything is in there. Are we all together? Any and everything is, is in there. It's not restricted to a particular thing. It's jami'ah. It's everything in there. And a book like that is Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari is not restricted to a particular thing. Imam Bukhari wrote it with everything in there. It talks about heart softening, it talks about virtues of the companions, it will talk about uh, fiqh issues that you want to learn, it will do tafsir, everything and anything is in there. It's called jami'ah. It's comprehensive. It deals with just about the, all the aspects of the religion. Are we all together? And there are some books 
which only talk about fiqh issues. The hadiths are only fiqh issues. Are we all together, brothers? What is it? Only fiqh issues. And Bulughul Maram is like that. It's called a hadithul ahkam. Bulughul Maram, the book that we're studying today, is not an ordinary fiqh, uh, hadith book. It's a hadith book where you, each hadith has a fiqh issue that you can take out of it. Rulings in how to live your life, whether it comes to tahara, how to purify yourself, whether it be salah, whether it be fasting, whether it be zakat, whether it be hajj, whether it be marriage, whether it be buying and selling, whether it be divorce, and etc. All of that, you'll find it in this book. So what is this book called? A hadith al-ahkam. It's like a, it falls under that chapter. A hadith al-ahkam. Hukum. These ahadiths have rulings in it. And it's, the, it's similar to the kitab Umdat al-ahkam. It's similar to what book? It's similar to? It's similar to Umdat al-ahkam. That's what it's similar to. And it's also similar to the kitab Muntaq al-Akhbar by Majduddin Abu al-Barakat, the grandfather of Ibn Taymiyyah. And also Al-Muharrar by Ibn Abdul Hadi. Those books are all similar. Are we all together? Okay. This book, Bulugh al-Maram, is a Hadith al-Ahkam book better than any Hadith al-Ahkam book that has ever been written. The best. Bulugh al-Maram is the best. Better than any one of those that were written. Very comprehensive. In the sense that the author, rahimahullah, he really dug deep to bring these hadiths together. The book is better than all of the other hadith, al-ahkam books. Whether it be Umdat al-ahkam, whether it be what? Whether it be al-muntaqa by Majuddin Abu al-Barakat, whether it even be al-muharrar by Ibn Abd al-Hadi, it doesn't matter. All of those books, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, is what? Ibn Hajar's Bulugh al-Maram is much better. Number two, the author himself is more knowledgeable than all of those people in hadith. Rahimahullah Ibn Hajar. He passed all of those people. And so the book, the value goes up because of the author, right? And his knowledge and who he is. I'm not undermining the other books. Like for example, the book Mu'umdatul Ahkam, all of the hadiths that are in there are authentic. But the hadith that are in the Umdatul Ahkam is 400 and what? 420, 400 and something like that. Like in this one has more than that. Bulugh al-Maram has much more than that. And it's also got benefits from each hadith better than Bulugh Umdatul Ahkam. So that's why we chose to go through this kitab Bulugh al-Maram instead of Umdatul Ahkam on the issue of Hajj. The ahadiths that are in Kitab al-Hajj are 75 hadiths. Kitab al-Hajj in Bulugh al-Maram, the hadiths that are in there are 70, 75. So the question here is, we have five days. How many hadiths are we going to have to take each day? 15, right? In order to finish. So every day we'll take 15 hadiths, inshallah ta'ala. We will talk about whether the hadith is weak or, or not. If the hadith is weak, we'll point it out. And we'll also extract the benefits from the hadiths. Rulings and the benefits that are in those hadiths. Now inshallah ta'ala, we still have time before the Salatul Maghrib. We're going to start inshallah ta'ala, the book. The author started by saying Kitab al-Hajj. He said, Kitab al-Hajj. The question here is, um, what does Hajj mean in the Arabic language? What do the Arabs consider Hajj? What do they mean by Hajj? That word, it was used before Islam. The Arabs were using that word. They had it. It meant something to them. The Quran and the Sunnah borrowed these words and it used it 
and sometimes it added more meaning to it or it took some meaning out of it but the term will always have a lexical meaning or a linguistic meaning the Arabs would be using it before Islam so what does the word Hajj mean before Islam I mean, what did it mean in the Arabic language it means Al-Qasd Al-Qasd intent to intend something it's to intend something what does it mean in the Sharia that's what it means in the Arabic language but what does it mean in the Sharia what does it mean in the religion when you read the word Hajj in the Quran when you see the word Hajj in the Hadith of the Prophet when the scholars say Hajj what do they mean by Hajj what does it mean in the religion we know what it means in the Arabic language but what does it mean in the religion in the religion it means it is to intend this is the religion it is to intend by worshipping Allah Azza wa Jalla manasiki to fulfill manasik we'll talk about what these what it means manasik to fulfill manasik ala sifatin makhsusah in a particular way in a particular description fi waqtin makhsusah and in a particular timing so the person intends to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla that's who they're intending they're not doing it for anyone else they're intending to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla and they're also intending to go to the house of Allah Azza wa Jalla to get closer to Allah by it to fulfill what? Manasik Manasik will come to that that's the whole purpose of this course is to talk about the Hajj man Manasik the Manasik of the Hajj we'll talk about what they are each one in details inshallah ta'ala the person does those manasik in what way ala sifatin makhsusa in a prescribed manner you don't do it as you wish the quran and the sunnah tell you how you have to do it fi waqtin makhsus and at a particular time you can't do hajj now if you want to no, no, there's a time for it. We'll talk about that in details as well when we come to the chapter of Al Miqat. And we speak about the Miqat Zamaniya and the Miqat Makaniya. That's what it means in the what? In the Sharia. We also have to talk about Umrah. Because Umrah has also been spoken about here as well. The author, Rahimahullah, he speaks about Umrah. What does Umrah mean? Umrah, Logatan, in the Arabic language, it means a ziyara, is to go and visit. The word Umrah, it means visit. Ziyara. Ziyara is to do ziyara, to visit. That's what it means. But what does it mean um, in the Sharia? It means to visit the house of Allah. See, the, the Sharia always takes the Arabic meaning and it uses it, but it, it restricts the meaning or it sometimes unrestricts the meaning so it is to visit the house of Allah by doing four things by doing what? by doing three things or four things let's say four things the first one is At-Tawaf and As-Sa'i Bayna Safa Wal Marwa And the third one is halq, shaving your hair. And the reason why I said the fourth one is at taqsir, shortening your hair if you don't want to shave it all. You're doing, you're going to the house of Allah and visiting the house of Allah to do that. So you're going there to do what? To do tawaf, circumambulation around the Kaaba seven times, and also to do sa'i. It is to walk between the two mountains, al Safa and al Maru seven times or to shorten your hair or to shave your hair the question here is what is the ruling of Hajj 
What is the ruling? Is Hajj recommended? Is Hajj haram? Is Hajj wajib? Is Hajj mubah? If you want, you can do it. If you want, you can leave it. It's up to you. Is it makruh, disliked? So when you hear the word, what is the ruling of this thing, you have to remember it's either one of five. See the wajib? Somebody says to you, what is the ruling in this issue? You have to remember it's one of five. It's either wajib, you have to do it. It's obligatory on you. Or it's the polar opposite, which is prohibited, haram. Or it is makruh, disliked. Or it's mustahab, highly recommended. Or recommended. And the fifth one is that is mubah. Whether you do it or whether you leave it, it's up to you. So the question here is which of those five does Hajj fall under? Hajj is wajib. Once in the person's life, it's wajib. And the evidence for that is in the Quran. Because Allah said, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Allah said that. وَلِلَّهِ Allah has upon the people. Allah demands from the creation. Allah prescribed and made it obligatory on the creation. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا To go and to do pilgrimage to the house of Allah. The one who has the ability. And we'll talk about what the ability means and etc. All of that is going to come to us. That's the Quran. The Sunnah also shows that it's obligatory. Based on the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, Buni al Islamu ala khamsin. Islam is built upon five foundations. And from the five is what? The five, one of the five is. To go to the Kaaba and visit the Kaaba and to do Hajj for the one who has the ability to do so. So that's the Sunnah. And it's also a consensus, meaning the scholars never differed. No scholar has ever come and said, Hajj. Yeah, I don't think it's obligatory. You don't have to do it, it's your choice. No scholar has ever said that. No one's from the scholars has ever, ever said that. It's a unanimously agreed upon. That the Hajj is obligatory once in a lifetime. Al Imam ibn al Mundir he said, Ajma'at al Ummah. He didn't just say the scholars. He said that the Ummah are unanimously, the whole entire Ummah unanimously agree upon. Whether it be a scholar, whether it be a normal Muslim, everyone agrees upon what? Ala wujub al Hajj, that the Hajj is obligatory. Ala al Mustati'i, on the one who has the ability, fil umri marratan wahida, once in a person's life. That's a consensus. There's no difference of opinion. So no one can come a hundred years later and say, well, let's revise the text. Let's look at the Quranic discourse and see whether it's saying that we have to do Hajj. No. That door is shut. It's a consensus. And the beauty about consensus is it stops anyone from having to throw in an opinion. Your opinion doesn't matter once there is a consensus it stops all of that but there if there is a difference amongst the scholars you will then follow who you you see to be correct and upright in that view the next point that I, I want to mention I defined it which was the first the second thing I did was I told you the ruling of Hajj and the third thing that I want to do inshallah ta'ala is I want to talk about when was Hajj made obligatory when did it become obligatory some scholars, they said, قَبْلَ الْهِجْرَةِ Before the messenger migrated to Mecca and Medina, Hajj was made obligatory. There are some scholars who said that. Okay? They said that. And Ibn Hajar, he said, هُوَ شَاذٌ He said, this is a fringe opinion. It's a what? It's a fringe opinion. It's an opinion that doesn't hold much weight. It's discarded has no weight good Waqila and some scholars they said after 
the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated. This is the overwhelming majority. This is what nearly all the scholars have said. That it was after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina. But they then differed amongst themselves. Okay, but what year after he migrated to Medina? So the overwhelming majority of scholars, they said it is Sanat al-Sadisa, the sixth year after the Hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said because the ayah came down وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّةِ وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّةِ Complete Hajj وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ Complete Hajj and Umrah for Allah Azza wa Jalla. When that ayah came down وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّةِ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ Complete Hajj and Umrah for Allah. When that ayah came down they said that is what it was, that was when it was made obligatory and that ayah came on the sixth year of the Hijriah. That's what they said. And that's the opinion Ibn Hajar strengthened. Hafid Ibn Hajar, the author of this book. Uh, he strengthened that opinion that the Hajj was made obligatory what year? The sixth year of the Hijriah. Some scholars, they said, no, it's not. It's what? Sanata Tis'in. It's the ninth year of the Hijriah. Ninth. And this is the view pushed by Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah And he's Zad. Zad al-Ma'ad fi hadi khayr al-Ibad. Ibn Hajar, Ibn Al-Qayyim, he pushed the opinion that it's the ninth year of the Hijriyyah. And his opinion is the strongest. Because he said that وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّةِ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ talks about, and we're going to touch on that later inshaAllah ta'ala, it talks about once a person embarks on doing Hajj, they have to complete it. But it doesn't talk about starting Hajj in the first place. It doesn't talk about Hajj being obligatory for you to do it in the first place. And that's what the discussion is, right? When was the first time Hajj was made obligatory for the person to go and do Hajj? This ayah shows that once you start doing Hajj, you have to what? You have to complete it. You have to complete it. So that must show that the Hajj was voluntary because you, were, you, you didn't have to do it. So you went and you did Hajj for the second time of your life. You went to the house of Allah. You did everything. You wore the ihram. You went and you came. And once you got there, you said, you know what? I don't want to do it. No. You have to finish it. It's wajib upon you now that you started it. And the scholars, they say, Hajj is the only act yajibu in the shuru'ah. It becomes obligatory once you embark on it. Even if it was voluntary, even if it was a sunnah at the beginning for you, and you didn't have to do hajj, but you went out of your way and you went to do hajj. Now that you went into doing hajj, you have to complete it. Because the ayah says, Complete it. And that's the only ibadah where the person has to complete it. That's the only ibadah. The other ibadat. If you embark on it, you're allowed to come out of it. For instance, fasting Mondays and Thursdays. Okay? It's not obligatory. But a person says, you know what, I'm going to fast. And at Dhuhr time, he felt like, no, I don't want to fast. He's allowed to break it. He's allowed to and he's entitled to break it. لَا يَجِبْ عِنْدَ الشُّرُوحِ لَكِنْ Hajj is the only act where there's a textual evidence to show that once you embark on it, you have to finish it off. Anyways, coming back to the ayah wa atimu al-hajja wa al-umrata lillah, this ayah that Ibn Hajar is using to say that the hajj was made obligatory on the sixth year, this ayah doesn't show that. This ayah shows that you just have to complete hajj once you've embarked on it. But it doesn't indicate the ayah that this is when hajj was made obligatory for the person to do it. We still need to have an evidence for that. So there was no evidence on the sixth year of the hijriyah. The correct opinion is that it's the ninth year of the Hijriyyah. So, the question here that I want to put forward to you all is, why didn't the Messenger do Hajj then? On the ninth year of the Hijriyyah, why didn't the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why didn't he not do Hajj? If that was when it was made obligatory. Shall I answer it or shall I give it to you guys as homework for tomorrow? Are you? Or do you guys want to try answering it now 
He wants to take a, a crack on it, as they say. Yeah, yeah, Baba. Very good, mashallah. So that year, one goal is that the non-Muslims were doing hajj and it was overcrowded. And so they were going to do it in a, a wrong way. They used to do hajj and umrah with no clothes on. Because they used to believe that we sinned with these clothings. And so the Prophet didn't want to go. Any other any other answers that one may have? If you know the seer of the Prophet ﷺ, you will know that Sanati Tasi'ati min al-Hijrah, it was called Amul Wufud, the year of the delegation. There were many delegations coming to the Messenger ﷺ from everywhere at that particular time. And so that was one of the reasons why he ﷺ didn't do Hajj that year. And, there, and, and the honorable brother, the other answer he gave was also given by scholars as well. But those scholars who said the fact that the messenger delayed Hajj and he didn't do it is an indication to show that you, even if Hajj is obligatory on you, you don't have to do it that year, you can delay it. Using this is incorrect, brothers and sisters. It's incorrect. Hajj becomes obligatory straight away the minute you have the ability. And we will talk about what it means ability. We'll come to that. Inshallah ta'ala, we will take what that means. But the ability, once it's found, Hajj becomes obligatory al-fawri straight away. It becomes obligatory al-fawri. The next point that I want to talk about is what's the ruling of the person who leaves Hajj? When he has the ability to do hajj and he's never done it before he leaves it off out of laziness what is his ruling he believes it's obligatory he believes it's binding upon him to go hajj but he leaves it out of laziness i mean if he leaves it out of stubbornness and he doesn't believe that hajj is obligatory on me and he's like why do i have to go to hajj and why do i have to do this and no i don't believe that i don't believe in hajj if he says that then the consensus of the scholars is that he's not a Muslim. The scholars all unanimously agree upon that. There's no difference of opinion on that. But there is the second one, which is a person who believes it's obligatory. He goes, Naam, it's in the Quran, it's in the Sunnah. I know I have to go Hajj. But then he doesn't go. And he's got the money. And he's lazy to go. He, look, he watches the TV and he sees how crowded it is. And he's like, oh. I'm going to sweat there. It's going to be hard for me. And he doesn't go for, for those reasons. What's his ruling? The scholars have two views. One group of scholars, they said he's a disbeliever. Because of the ayah, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ عَلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا وَمَنْ كَفَرَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَيْكَ مُظَالِمُونَ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ And anyone who disbelieves. After Allah said, Hajj is obligatory on you. After that, Allah says, anyone who disbelieves. So some scholars, they took the ayah at its apparent, and, they, and it's literal, and they said that it means you're a, the one who leaves it out of laziness is a disbeliever. And that view is not strong. That's a weak opinion. The second opinion is that he's not a disbeliever, but he's a criminal, he's a sinner, and he needs to fear Allah Azza wa and go Hajj. That's the second opinion. But how do, we, how do we then respond to the ayah that the other party brought forward? Shaykh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiyati, rahimahullah, in his kitab, Adwa'u al-Bayan, he responds to that. He says that the response to that is that وَمَنْ كَفَرَ It means وَمَنْ جَحَدَ فَرِيضَةَ الْحَجِّ It means the one who rejects the obligation of hajj. He denies hajj. He says, hajj is not on me. That's what it means. That is the one who disbelieved. That's what he said, rahimahullah ta'ala. Another point that I want to mention. What about if a person does hajj without... Sorry, if, what about if a person does hajj bimalin haramin, haram wealth. He robbed some money from somewhere or he took riba from a bank or 
or etc. It has haram money. And he goes to the house of Allah, he's already done it. He's done his hajj. Did that hajj uplift from him the obligation? Meaning does he have to still do another hajj? And that previous hajj is null and void? Or is it considered? But he's a sinner. Which of those two is it? That which seems strongest well, ilmu عند الله عز وجل and knowledge is with Allah is that that hajj that he did it's taken in. It's accepted. But he's a sinner. He's a what? He's a sinner for doing hajj bimalin haramin with wealth which is with wealth which is haram. He's a sinner for doing it. But he is not requested to do hajj again. Meaning he's, the, he's done the one time hajj that was upon him. But he has sinned. He had gone against Allah Taala's command and he should ask for forgiveness and repentance. And if it's wealth of humans that he has taken, he should send, give them back that money. And I would encourage him to go and do what? To try and go do Umrah or Hajj again. It is, and that's the view that Imam Nawi mentions in Hij Majmu'ah, and also the fatwa of Sheikh Abd Aziz Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and the fatwa, fatwa legend Da'ima, and also the view of Ibn Al Qayyim, Rahimahumullah Jami'an. May Allah have mercy upon all of those scholars. It's like a person who steals clothes and he prays in the clothes that he stole. That doesn't make his salah null and void. It doesn't. His salah is correct. As long as he prays it by doing, reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, he comes with the arkan and the pillars of the salah, he comes with the conditions of the salah, he comes with the wajibat of the salah, he stays away from the muqtilat and the things that can nullify the prayer. As long as he does that, his salah is correct. But he's a sinner from taking someone's clothing, or rubbing a cloth, and etc. After the Salah, inshallah ta'ala, we will go directly into the uh, chapter, the first chapter of Kitab Al-Hajj from Bulugh Al-Marab, uh, al Kareem. Now we're going to go into the first chapter of Kitab Al-Hajj. Hafid ibn Hajar, and he said, Babu Fadlihi, the chapter that deals with the virtue of Hajj and Umrah. وَبَيَانِي And this chapter is also going to clarify for us and explain to us مَنْ فُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ Who was Hajj made obligatory on? Who is Hajj obligatory on? Who has to do Hajj? Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه He said that the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم He said العمرة إلى العمرة one Umrah to another Umrah is a kafaratun, it's an expiation lima baynahuma in between the two. The alternation of um, Umrah to another Umrah is an expiation. Walhajjul mabruru and an accepted Hajj, a, a Hajj that is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ There is no other reward for it إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ The person only gets Jannah from it. مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ means Bukhari and Muslim both narrated. This hadith, what it shows us and it benefits us is فَضْلُ الْإِكْثَارِ The virtue in increasing in Umrah. This hadith shows that a person should really increase in doing Umrah. should do a lot. Umrah to ila al-umrah kaffara to lima baynahuma. That it's going to be an expiation and the person should hasten to increase in it. This is what this hadith shows. And it also shows us the great virtue that's in Umrah. That it will wipe away our sins. Like in the overwhelming majority of the scholars, al-jumhur, the majority of scholars, they say that the sin that it will wipe off or it will wipe away or it, or, or it will get rid of is as-sagha'ir dun al-kaba'ir the minor sins ah 
minor sins. The major sins, they require repentance. We all know the three conditions of repentance, right? Al-iqla'u min al dhambi The person has to leave the sin. Al-nadam, the person has to regret it. Al-azmu alla ya'uda ilayhi. And the third one is that the person makes an unwavering conviction that they will not fall into this sin again. Those are the three conditions of repentance, right? That's for the major sin. You see, the minor sins on the other hand, Umrah will get rid of it. Because we sometimes do sins, minor sins that we don't pick up on. We're even evil enough, subhanAllah, that we do major sins that we don't even know of. So, the major sins require repentance. As for the minor sins, Umrah will get rid of it. And we spoke about this in the chapter of fasting. Remember in Umdatul Ahkam, we discussed it there. This hadith also, a lot of scholars use this hadith uh, that a person can continuously and repeatedly keep doing Umrah. In one year, four or five times, you can do Umrah, no problem. The scholars, some scholars, they took it from this hadith. You can do two, or you can even do more if you want to. And they said, this hadith benefits this. As Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah mentioned. Also, this hadith, ala itlaqihi, the way it's unrestricted, it shows that there's a difference between what? Umrah and Hajj. It does it. It does, right? That Umrah is something and Hajj is something else. And that's important. It's very important to keep on to because it will come to a discussion later, inshallah ta'ala. That Umrah is something and Hajj is something else. That's what this hadith benefits us. Because the question is how? How does it show that they're different? Two ways. One, Al-Umratu ila Al-Umrati kafaratu lima baynawma wal hajjul mabrur. They're separated from one another with that special wow. Hajj is something and wow. Al-Umrah is something. Another thing shows it that Umrah can be done multiple times, whereas Hajj can only be done what? Once. Hajj can only be done what? Once in the year. You can't do it more than once a year. Like in Umrah, you can do what? Ten times a year. Twenty times a year. You can do as much as you want. So, this is again an indication that Umrah and Hajj are two separate things. Good. Hajj has a time where it passes you. Umrah, does it have a, pa- a time when it passes you? No. Umrah can be any time. It can be any time. And Imam Malik, he said, يُكْرَهُ It is disliked. And يَعْتَمِرَ فِي السَّنَةِ مَرَّتَيْنِ That the person does Umrah twice a year. And Imam Malik said this. Imam Udari, Imam Udari Hijra. Al-Imam Malik said to do Umrah twice a year is disliked. And it's a view held by some of the Salaf, like Ibrahim al nakhai and Hassan al basri and Sa'id ibn Jubairin and Muhammad ibn Sirin. Oh, that's their opinion. I'll repeat the name for you again. Ibrahim al nakhai held the opinion that a person should not do Umrah twice a year. And it was an opinion held by Hassan al basri And it was also a view held by Sa'id ibn Jubair. And it was also opinion held by Muhammad ibn Sirin. And the evidence that they really held on to was the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions لم يعتمروا في السنة إلا مرة واحدة That they only done Umrah once. The Messenger and his companions only done what? They only done once Umrah. And the response to that is وَهَذَا لَا حُجَّةَ فِي There's no evidence in that. There is no strong evidence that Ibrahim al nakhaiyan Hassan al basriyan Sa'id ibn Jubairin, and Muhammad ibn Sirin, and Imam Malik hold on to. This evidence is not strong enough for them. To say that the Messenger only done it once doesn't mean that you can't do it more than once. Are we all together? Just because the Messenger done it once doesn't necessarily mean what? That the person can't do more than once. The reason is because there is a 
oral statement of the messenger saying al-umratu ila al-umrah kafaratu lima baynouma that one umrah to the other umrah which shows takrar repetition it shows repetition and, and that's important some may say but okay that's still not a strong argument uh, why they might say they might say well they do say this that one umrah to the other umrah means one umrah a year still we'll say why have you restricted it to once a year then that restriction of you saying that it means only once a year needs evidence are we all together that which the sharia said unrestrictedly it can be two weeks separate it can be two three days separate it can be one year separate the two umrahs why have you said it has to be one year separate why that needs an evidence it has to be left unrestricted that's very important and one of the other evidences that the Sheikh didn't bring that shows the virtue of increasing in Umrah is the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said Tabi'u bayna al-hajj wal-umrah Alternate between hajj and umrah Alternate فَإِنَّهُ مَا يَنْفَيَانِ الْفَقْرَ وَالذُّنُوبَ Because they eradicate They get rid of They remove Poverty Hajj removes poverty Umrah removes poverty وَالذُّنُوبَ And they remove sins Minor sins Major sins, what do they need? Major sins requires repentance. Like the bellow, it removes what? The filth and the rusty, the rustiness on the, of the metal. And the accepted hajj, there is no other reward for it except what? Except Jannah. Here there's a very powerful question which is what does it mean? Because the hadith clearly says a hajj al-mabrur, there's jannah for it. The question that one who's going to the house of Allah needs to ask himself is what is al-hajj al-mabrur? It's important. I'm going to give a general answer and then I'm going to give a detailed answer. The general answer is the answer given by al-imam al-nawawi and he said asahu ma qila fil babi it's the strongest thing that was said. But it's a general answer, and I'm going to break that down. Is الذي لا يخالطه إثم الحج المبرور is the Hajj where the person doesn't mix it up with sins. Person avoids sinning whilst doing Hajj. That's a general, still not detailed. Sheikh Abdullah ibn Salih al-Fawzan on the Sharh of Bulugh al-Maram, one of the good shuruh on Bulugh al-Maram is called Minhat al-Alam. Fisharh al Bulugh al Maram, 10 volume book. Darum al Jawzi published it. It's one of the best explanations. He's the Shaykh who explained Al Waraqat. Very good scholar when it comes to explaining books. He also recently published an explanation on the Kitab Umdatul Ahkam. He called it Al Ifham Fi Sharh Umdatul Ahkam. He said, Al Hajjul Mabrur lahu khamsatu awsaf. The Hajj, which is Mabrur, has five descriptions. Five attributes. Number one, أَن يَكُونَ خَالِصًا لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى This Hajj is done only for Allah's sake. No one else is being done for. This person is doing ibtigha'a وَجْهِ اللَّهِ He's not doing it to call his family and say, I'm going this year, inshaAllah ta'ala, and he's spreading the news. Or some communities and some people, they like to be called Haji. They like that title. When they go to the Kaaba and they come back, they get given that title. And so they, they're working to get in that title. It's, it's, a, it's, it's common in a particular community that needs no mentioning. So it, don't. This person has to do it for the sake of Allah. What destroys that? Selfies. Going out there and recording yourself and Showing off on social media and telling everyone about it and showing how much you're sweating when you're walking between Arafah and the Jamarat and telling somebody to record me while I'm stoning the shaitan. First of all, stone the shaitan which is running in your blood. In the shaitan that's running in your blood, that's convinced you to record yourself while you're doing a righteous deed, 
maybe you should start by stoning that one and getting rid of that one, sah? So the person stays away from showing off. You see, ikhlas, what goes against it is two things. A sum'a wa riya. Sum'a is once you've done the righteous action and once you've done hajj, you didn't record it. You didn't talk about it when you were there. You didn't even speak about it before you went there. But you talk about it once you come back. With the intent, of course, some scholars, they went hajj and they spoke about their hajj experience and they made it beneficial for the people. Like Shaykh Muhammad bin Shaqiyati, he wrote a kitab on it. Rihlati ila bayatillahi al-haram. I'm not saying everyone who talks about their hajj is wrong. But I'm saying if your intention is to show off and tell people that my package was the five-star one and I stayed in this place, we were very close to the Jamarat. And we were this and we were given this package. Sum'a is called. Sum'a means what? You talk about it once you've, you've done the righteous action. You, pr- you prayed Qiyamul Layl and then in the morning you wake up and you say, whew, whew, last night, did you guys see the earthquake? Why? Why I was in Qiyam, I was praying. That's Sum'a. That's talking about it once you've done it. And Riyat means you do it at that moment so people can't see you which is recording it, and live streaming it. A person should stay away from it. It has to be for the sake of Allah. If you want your hajj to be hajj mabrur, and there's no other reward except jannah, and all of the money you paid, you want it to be, inshallah ta'ala, it doesn't go to vain, then make sure you do that first point. The second point is, and takuna nafaqah, the wealth that you're going to hajj for. It has to be from min malin halal, halal wealth. Because we know the hadith, Inna Allah tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyibah. Allah is tayyib and he doesn't accept, and he doesn't take in except that which is good. Are we all together? So make sure the wealth that you go to hajj with is what? It's tayyib. Remember brothers, there is a difference between sahih and maqbool. Sahih means that this salah is correct. Okay, no problem. You paid a good salah. But is it maqbul? No, not necessarily. A hajj can be sahih. You did everything that was needed. You went to Arafah, you did this, you did the arkan, you did the pillars, you did the wajibat, you did what was needed from you. It's sahih. No one can tell you that you have to do hajj again. Bara'atu dhimma. Your neck is free from it. Lakin is it maqbul? Is it mabrur? Not necessarily. Are we all together, brothers? So not everything which is sahih is maqbul. So if you want your... If you do it with haram money, your hajj is sahih. But it's not maqbul. You don't get the qubul from Allah. So make sure it's your, the wealth is halal. Don't use money that you took from a bank and on riba or money that came from a, a wrong transaction and a wrong business that you're in. Nor should you go to Hajj with money that you stole from someone. You took someone's money from them and you said to them, I am going to do business for you. And you take that money and you make a li- livelihood out of it. Number three. Al-bu'du anil ma'asi wal athab. The person stays away from sins. Al-bu'd. To stay away from anil ma'asi. Stay away from sins. Wal athab. Immoral acts. Innovation. Is a sin. Stay away from mukhalafat shari'ah. Things that go directly against what the sharia prescribed, what the sharia permitted for you. And that will affect this righteous action that you're trying to do. Didn't Allah not say in the Quran, Al Hajju Ashfurum Ma'alumat, Faman Farada Fihin Al Hajja Hajja, Fala Rafatha, Wala Fusuka, Wala Jidala Fil Hajj. No vulgar statements, no sexual intercourse whilst you're in a state of Hajj, no cheating, no lying, no getting angry with the Muslims around you, no, all of that. The person stays away from sins, stays away from sins. And subhanAllah, some people in Hajj, they do innovation in the Hajj. Bid'ah. 
which we'll speak about in the, in the, in the book. And some people even do inna lillahi wa inna ila raja'un shirk. Wa huwa yatufu bil bayt. He's doing tawaf around the Kaaba and he's calling on to other than Allah. You're in the house of Allah. Why don't you call on to Allah? Why are you calling on to anyone other than Allah? So he's calling on to a shaykh. He's calling on to someone other than who? Other than Allah. The beauty about Islam, it's that it's a religion. There is no one between you and Allah. Why are you placing someone between you and Allah? You have a direct link with Allah Azza wa Jalla. You don't need to come to the Imam and say, Shaykh, I did this sin. Go to your Lord and confess to him and speak to him and ask him for forgiveness. No human needs to know. This is the blessings of our religion. But some people want to take that away from themselves and go through channels and people like the Christians do. A confession box. Just to go in there and talk to the priest and tell him all the crimes that he's done. And the priest is connected to the police. So whenever you do a big crime, the person is behind bars. Are we all together? Why? Go to your Lord, Allah Azza wa Jalla. Have that relationship with Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. Number four, husnul khuluq, walinul janib. The fourth one is husnul khuluq, good manners, good etiquettes, walinul janib, and the person's softness. When you go there. Be a person who is mutawadi, humble. Soften yourself for the people, serve the people. Wallahi, one of the shuyukhs, whose story I heard, he's still alive today, was Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shaqiyatiyu. Still alive. They said about this man, may Allah honor him, and shawa his never ending mercy onto him. They said in Hajj, what he does is, He covers his mouth with his ihram. And he goes around helping the people. The weak one who needs to be picked up. This is a man who teaches in the Prophet's Masjid. Till today he teaches in the Prophet's Masjid. Medina. He has a seat there. He's been teaching for decades. He goes around in Hajj. Students of knowledge caught him. Hiding from the people. He doesn't want no one to catch him. And he's doing righteous action for the people. Serving them water. Carrying people. Grabbing them. He went there with the intent of what? Ajar. When you go there, you're going to see the black stone. Everyone is charging there. Remember, touching the black stone is a very gracious, noble act. Like in the honor of your Muslim brother. Not hurting him. Not harming him. Takes precedence over that. So if you leave it for that sake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward of what? As though you touch the black stone. Are we all together brothers? So it's a time when you exercise good manners, good akhlaq, the way that you are, the heat is going to hit you. It's hot, you're going to stay in a tent. You're going to, some people are not nice to you. You just have to smile because you came from a far place. You don't want to lose out from Getting a hajjul mabroor. Are we all together, brothers? Number five is ta'zimu sha'airillahi ta'ala. That you honor and you venerate and you glorify the Islamic symbols. Um, the sha'air are the sanctuaries of Allah Azza wa Jalla. The person honors it. Meaning you're in the Kaaba. This is a place which is venerable, honorable. Sanctuary. Honor this place. When you're doing actions of hajj, do it with sakina and al-waqar. Tranquility. Don't mock it. Don't play around. Honor it. The person has to. Honoring it means, as Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, is by doing a takbir wa tasbih wa tahleel wa tahmidu. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. The person's dhikr on their mouth. And remember what Allah said in the Quran. ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فهو ذلك ومن يعظم حرمات الله فهو خير له فهو خير له عند ربه الله سبحانه وتعالى هذه الآية ذلك ومن يعظم شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب so honor you're going to suffer والمر think about it because this is from the شعائر of الله إن الصفا والمروة من شعائر الله symbols of Islam 
Think of who used to walk on this road that you're on today. Contemplation and thinking. Nabi Allah Ibrahim left his family here in the middle of the desert. And he walked away from his wife. And he walked away from his child. And then she, she called him. She said, Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to leave us here? Did Allah tell you to leave us here? And she said, he, he said to her, yes, Allah did command me to leave you here. And then she responded, and she said, إِذَا لَا يُضَيُّعُنَ اللَّهِ Then Allah is not going to forsake us. Allah commanded you. Remember this place was a desert. It was a desert. By herself and her child. Allah brought the Zamzam water from there. She ran seven times from one. Whenever she reaches this Safa and the Kamaru, she keeps running. She sees water. She thinks it's a mirage. She keeps going and back and forth until... The Zamzam water came from, from beneath her son's feet. Ismail. Are we all together? When you're there, you're feeling all of that. Sha'air al-Islam. This is Islamic symbols. The place that you're walking on is verified that Nabi Muhammad once upon a time was walking here. You feel it. It's the taqwa of the heart. Those five, if you come with it, you will definitely come with Al Hajj al Mabrur. And Hajj al Mabrur, what did we say it, the reward for it is? Laysa lahu jaza'ul illa al Jannah. Only Jannah. The author here, he speaks about and he talks about the ruling Hukmul Umrah. What is the ruling of Umrah? All of these hadiths is now going to mention to us what is the ruling of Umrah. Is Umrah wajib or is it mustahab, highly recommended? Aisha, she said, رضي الله تعالى عنها, may Allah be pleased with her and her father, قالت, she said, قل to I said, Aisha said, يا رسول الله, or Messenger of Allah, على النساء جهاد. The word على النساء, it's meant to be what? على النساء. على النساء جهاد. There's an alif istifham. حذفت. It was removed. And the Arabs do that. It's removed. And al Akfash from the grammarians, he said that it's removed min babi from the angle of al Qiyas. Which is not a correct opinion, and there's no reason to go into that technicality now. Like in the hadith, is Is there? Aisha's asking. Jihad for the women, and the jihad she's talking about here is what? Al jihad be safe, fighting with the sword. She's not talking about jihad of the word, because that's for the men and the women. The word here meaning what? Spreading Islam. That's a form of jihad. She is referring to jihad be safe. Like the men go and fight. Can the women go and fight? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he responded to her by saying, when she asked that question, he said, Naam, there is jihad for the men, women. Lakin alayhinna jihadu la qitala fi. Like in the jihad that's for the women, there's no fighting. The women, there is a jihad for them. But the jihad that's for the women is what? It's Laqi Talafi, there's no fighting involved. It's not a combat. Where two parties are fighting. No. Aisha then he carried on saying to his wife, Aisha, Al Hajj wal Umrah. Hajj and what? Umrah. And then if you look at our 
Quranic discourse, I mean the, Quran, the religious text, you tend to find that the term jihad is a very broad term. The word jihad is a what? It's a very broad term. It's not a term that many people are equated to and understand. They think that the word jihad just means fighting. Like in the Messenger وسلم, I told her here that Hajj is a what? It's a jihad. Hajj is a what? It's a jihad. But there's no qital and there's no fighting. And Imam Ahmad narrated this, Ibn Majah narrated. And look at what Ibn Hajar said if you have the book with you. He said, Ibn Majah narrated this and the wording is the wording of Ibn Majah. And there is no la fa'ida tafihi. There's no fa'ida and benefit of Ibn Hajar saying that statement. Him saying, lahu, And the wording is the wording of Ibn Majah. Why? Because it's also the wording of Ahmed's Musnad as well. You generally say that when it's specific to one and not the other. But this wording, Ahmed narrated it as much as Ibn Majah narrated it. So why did he only restrict it to Ibn Majah? That's not correct. And this hadith is authentic. And the scholars that authenticated it is Ibn Khuzayma. Ibn Khuzayma authenticated this hadith. Um, and Imam al-Nawawi authenticated it. And Majduddin Ibn Taymiyyah, Abu al-Barakat, the grandfather of Ibn Taymiyyah, the author of the Kitab al-Muntaqa, Fi Akhbar al-Mustafa, which Al-Imam al-Shawkani explained in the book Nail al-Awtar. Nail al-Awtar is the Sharah of the Muntaqa by Ibn Taymiyyah's grandfather. He authenticated the Hadith. Ibn Abd al-Hadi in his Kitab al-Muharrar, he authenticated the Hadith. Ibn Kathir in his Irshad, he authenticated the Hadith. Hafid ibn Hajar authenticated it here. He said, well, it's not sahih. Al-Albani, rahimahullah, authenticated in his kitab, al Galil. So this hadith is what? This hadith is sahih. It's sahih. And it's what? It is authentic. وعن Jabir ibn Abdullah, Jabir said, رضي الله تعالى عنهما, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, Jabir and his father. أَتَنْ أَتَنْ نَبِيَّ أَتَنْ نَبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَعْرَابِيٌ A Bedouin man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم A Bedouin فقال the Bedouin man said يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ O Messenger of Allah أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْعُمْرَةِ Tell me about Umrah A wajibatun here is it obligatory Is Umrah obligatory فقال the Messenger said لا Umrah is not wajib. وَأَن تَعْتَمِرَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ أَمَا خَيْرُ لَكَ To do Umrah is better for you. But it's not obligatory. رَوَى أَحْمَدُ التِّرْمِذِي وَالْرَاجِحُ وَقْفُهُ Let's ponder over this hadith. First of all, is this hadith sahih, hadith Jabir? The hadith of Jabir that the Imam rahimahullah narrated, Hafiz ibn Hajar, it's weak. It's a hadith which is weak. Because he attributed to how many, how many sources? Ahmed and what? And Tirmidhi, right? Hadith Jabir is in where? Is in Muslim and Imam Ahmed and also Jamia Tirmidhi. I'm a Sunnah and Tirmidhi. Are we all together? In the Senate, in the chain of Ahmed in his Musnad and Tirmidhi in his Sunan is a man by the name of Hajjaj ibn Ardat. Hajjaj ibn Ardat. Who narrated from who? Muhammad ibn Munkadir. Who narrated from Jabir Marfu'an. This man, Hajjaj ibn Ardat, who is in the chain, there's two issues with him. There's two issues with him. The first issue is, he's an individual who is Kathir al Khata. He does many mistakes. So in terms of his memory, he's a what? He's inaccurate. He's not good with it when it comes to memory. So he is weak in terms of his dabt, his precision. Remember when a narrator is criticized in hadith, he's either criticized for one of two reasons. The first one is, he's what? 
his dabt, his precision, his memory, or his what? His, his adala, his integrity. Hajjaj ibn Ardat, his memorization is not that good. That's one mistake, that's one issue here. The second issue is, he's a mudallis, and he narrated the hadith with an'ana. He's a person who's known to drop people out of the chain. He's known to take people out of the chain of narration. To make the chain look good. So if him or anyone like him narrates a hadith with the word an, as he has done when he narrated from Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir. He narrated it from him with what? An, Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, who then narrated from Jabir. So his narration is also rejected from that perspective. Two reasons I mentioned. The first reason is Hajjaj ibn Artat, and the second one is and him having a say al hifz and the second one is he's a mudallis and he narrated the hadith with an ana half of the hajar is from the scholars who weaken this hadith and consider it to be what da'if there are 11 scholars who weaken this hadith the first one is imam ahmad ibn hanbal al imam al shafi'i ibn khuzayma ibn hazm al bayhaqi ibn al jawzi al nawawi Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar, Al Albani, and Al Mubarakafuri, the Indian scholar who has an expression on Sunan Tirmidhi, Tuhfatul Ahwadi, Fi Sharh Sunan Tirmidhi. He also weakened it as well. 11 scholars. They all graded it, they all graded it to be weak. So this hadith was the one hadith that could have shown that Umrah is not, it is not obligatory. No one can use that hadith and say Umrah is not obligatory because of this hadith because this hadith is what it's weak and if the hadith is weak the ruling that's taken from it is also weak anything that's built upon something that is false in the first place and a false premise was it was built on then the conclusion is going to be incorrect as well it's going to be what it's going to be wrong let's go to the next hadith that the author rahimahullah mentioned he said, وَعَنْ جَابِرٍ مَرْفُوعًا الْحَجُّ وَالْعُمْرَةُ فَرِضَتَانِ الْحَجُّ وَالْعُمْرَةُ الحج and Umrah, both of them are what? Both of them are فَرِضَتَانِ They are both obligatory. Um, this hadith is also weak. This hadith of Jabir. Jabir, two hadiths. Oh, by the way, before I, go, I, before I go to the next hadith. Hafid weakened the hadith that I mentioned before, right? The previous hadith that I just mentioned where the Prophet ﷺ said, Hajj is not obligatory, oh, sorry, Umrah is not obligatory unless you do it, it's good for you. For you to do it is good for you, right? I weakened it because of who? Hajjaj ibn Artatin, I said because of him, right? But Ibn Hajar did something. He weakened it in terms of attributing this to the Messenger. He weakened it. Like, what did he say? Warrajihu. He said, Warrajih waqfu. But the hadith is sahih in terms of it being attributed to who? Jabir. I Meaning he's saying, okay, yes, the Prophet didn't say this, but Jabir did. Are we all together? And that's also not correct. That attributing this to Jabir is also weak. Jabir rahimahullah ta'ala. It is not sahih mawqufan as well. It is also weak to be attributed to Jabir. Good. وَعَنْ جَابِرٍ مَرْفُوعًا عَنْ جَابِرْ Narrated from the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم الحج والعمرة فريضتان حج and عمرة both of them are what? فريضتان right? Yeah, they're both obligatory. This hadith is weak. Al-Hajj wal-Umrah to Faridatani, it's weak. Because in the chain of narration is a man by the name of Ibn Lahi'a. And Ibn Lahi'a is a person who's known for his weak memorization. But Ibn Adi is one of the people who narrated this hadith. He said, هذه الأحاديث عن Ibn Lahi'a عن أعطاء غير محفوظة. It's weak. So here we only have one hadith that Ibn Hajar brought, which is Sahih. Which one is it? The one 
The first one, that when Aisha asked the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nisai jihadun? Is there a jihad upon the women? Where the Messenger said, yes, the jihad that is upon, upon the women is which one? Hajj and? This is the only hadith which is sahih. So now we have to prove, is Hajj obligatory or not? Uh, sorry, Umrah, Umrah, Umrah. We know Hajj is obligatory. Like it is Umrah obligatory on the person, the strongest opinion is that it is. That Umrah is obligatory once in the person's lifetime. Hey, naam. It is obligatory. And that's the strongest opinion. What is the evidence for that? The evidence for that is the hadith of Jibreel. You know the hadith of Jibreel, right? بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ اِطَّلَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلٌ شَدِيدُ بَيَاطِ الْقِيَابِ شَدِيدُ السَّوَادِ الشَّعْرِ لَا يُرَى عَلَيْ أَثَرُ السَّفَرِ وَلَا يَعْرِفُ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ حَتَّى جَلَسَ إِلَى النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ You all know the famous hadith of Jibreel coming to the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and asking him about Islam and then asking him about Iman and then asking him about Ihsan and then asking him about the signs of the hour We all know that hadith, right? That hadith, there is a wording that was transmitted there is a wording that was transmitted that when the messenger was asked about when the messenger was asked about Islam Jibreel, what did he say to him? Tell me about Islam. Some of the wordings that were transmitted from the hadith of Jibreel, the Messenger وسلم, he said, Al Islam and Tashada Allah ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, wa an tuqima salah, wa tuqtiya zaka, wa tahujja al bayta, wa ta'ta mira, wa tahtasila min al janaba, wa an tutima al wudu'a wa tasuma ramadan. One of the wordings that came. The messenger, when he was asked about Islam, he gave the five that we already know, which was what? Shahadu ta'ala ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, wa iqamu salah, wa ita'i zakah, wa salamu ramadhan, wa hajji bayti ilaha al-haram. But he added more things in another wording that came from this hadith, which is that the messenger said, wa an ta'tamira, and that you do what? Umrah. So that shows you that it's Umrah is what? It's obligatory. Because he was asked about Islam and it was mentioned with what? Dalil al Iqtiran Ibn Shafi'i is using this that it's mentioned next to Hajj. Are we all together? Another hadith that shows that it's obligatory is the hadith of Abi Razin al Uqayli. The hadith of who? Abi Razin al Uqayli. Abu Dawood narrated in his Sunan. Hadith. Abu Razin al uqayli rahimahullah, Amr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Anahu atta al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Razin al uqayli came to the messenger. Faqala, he said, Ya Rasulullah, O messenger of Allah, Inna abi shaykh al-kabir. My father is an old man. La yastati'u al-hajjah. He is not able to do hajj. Wala al-umrah. Wala al-da'ana. My father is an old man. He can't bear the traveling. He hasn't got the physical ability to travel. Then what did the Prophet say? He's asking Hajj. My father can't do Hajj. He can't go and do Umrah. Now, if it was not obligatory, the Messenger would have said, go and do Hajj on behalf of your father, correct? But the Messenger said to him, Hujjah an abika wa'atamir. Do Hajj on behalf of your father and do Umrah on behalf of your father. Both of them you have to do on his behalf. This hadith is authenticated by an Imam a Tirmidhi authenticated this hadith Abi Razin al Uqayli. Al Imam al Darakotani authenticated it. Al Hakim authenticated it. Al Imam al Dhabi authenticated it. And also Al Imam Ahmed authenticated it. And Ahmed, Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, Something very powerful. He said, لا أعلم في إجاب العمرة حديثا أجود من هذا ولا أصح منه. I don't know. I don't know. Any hadith that shows the obligation of Umrah more authentic and more better than hadith Abi Razin al Uqayli. The previous hadith. 
the previous hadith that I mentioned, the hadith Jibreel. Some of the people they said, but this riwayah that you're mentioning, that wording that you're mentioning is shad. Some of the greatest scholars graded it shad. They said that the narrators who narrated it from Yahya ibn Ya'mar, none of them, none of them had mentioned wa anta atamira. So it's shad. I'll say to you, no, it's not shad. There are great noble scholars in number who've authenticated this and called it ziyadatu thiqah. From them is Abu Bakr al-Juzaqi rahimahullah. He has a, he has a kitab called Al-Mukharraj ala fi sahihain where he proves that this hadith is upon the condition of Bukhari Muslim. Abu Bakr al-Juzaqi, also Dara Qutni ibn Hibban, Abu Bakr al-Bayhaqi ibn Kathir, all of them authenticated the other hadith that I mentioned. So the views regarding whether Umrah is obligatory or not is two views. The first view is that it's not obligatory. It's not obligatory. And that's the view of Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa. Al Imam Malik and Al Imam Abu Hanifa say it's not obligatory. And it's a riwayah of Al Imam Ahmad. Al Imam Ahmad has two views. One view says that he believed it was Sunnah, and the other one he says that it was ob obligatory. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah held the opinion that it was highly recommended. And Al Imam Al Shawkani, Muhammad bin Ali Shawkani, he also held the opinion that it's also not obligatory but it highly recommended. The second view is the view held by Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Jabir ibn Abdullah, and a jama'atu min al-tabi'een, and a large number of the tabi'een, is that it's obligatory. And that is obligatory. And they used many hadiths. The hadith that I mentioned, and the hadith of Aisha, what did she say at the beginning? Ya Rasulallah, a'ala nisa'i jihadun. Is it upon the women jihad? And what did the messenger mention to her? Hajj and Umrah. He mentioned both of those things to her. She asked obligatory. Are we all together? Because the word here that's used is what? A'alan nisa'i jihadu. What did Allah say? Walillahi. Walillahi. A'alan nasi. The word ala that was used for the obligation of Hajj was used here as well. Are we all together? Which shows that Umrah is also obligatory once in a lifetime. But. If you do Hajj al-Tamattu, which we'll speak about, which is a Hajj where the person does Umrah and Hajj together, then that Umrah and that Hajj is, will uplift from you having to do Umrah separately. You don't have to do it separately. When you go now to do Hajj, the Hajj is three types of Hajj. There's Hajj al-Tamattu, Hajj, al hajj which is Al-Qiran and then Al-Ifrad. You choose Hajj al-Tamattu then you'll be able to do Hajj and Umrah. I will speak about that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, soon. Now, the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he goes into shuruṭu wujub al-hajj. He goes into the condition of hajj being obligatory. The shuruṭ here we're talking about is, the shuruṭ are two types, brothers. You have to learn this and remember this. The conditions are two types. Shuruṭ is a prerequisite. The shuruṭ are two types. Shartu wujub and shartu siha. You have to remember this. Shartu wujub and what? What does that mean? We're talking about what constitutes obligation. What makes it obligatory on a person to have to go and do what? Hajj or Umrah. What is it? That's called shartu wujub. That the condition, the prerequisite that makes it obligatory on the person. But if the person goes, even though they don't have the ability, they put themselves in debt to go and do Hajj. Pay attention here. Someone who doesn't have to go Hajj, he doesn't have the ability, and the ability is a what? 
What is the ability? A condition. Is it not a condition? Yeah? I want you to focus with me here, please. It's important. Is wudu a condition for salah? Yes or no? Do you have to have wudu? Yes. So we all agree that wudu is a condition for the salah. What about if a person prays a salah with no wudu? Is it accepted? Is it correct? Good. Is ability a condition for hajj? Is it not? Is, it is, right? What about if a person goes and does hajj without no ability? Is it accepted? Is it accepted? Very important question. Does everyone understand the question, first of all? Is the question crystal clear? Or do you want me to repeat it again? Shall I repeat it? We just said, we all agreed, to do wudu is a prerequisite. It's a condition. It's something that has to be found before you pray. You have to have wudu and then pray. Sahih? If you pray with no wudu, your prayer is what? Null and void. There's no salah. Repeat the prayer. You have to bring back that prayer. True or false? True, sir? Because it's a what? It's a condition. It's a shart. Okay, good. Is ability for had a condition? It's a condition. You're all right. Sah, correct. If a person goes to had with no ability, he goes out of his way, forces himself, he gets there. One way or another, and he didn't have the ability. If he does had, is his had accepted? And is it correct? The question here is, how is it that one condition, when it wasn't met, you said that the salah was null and void? And hajj, you said that ability is a condition, and once it wasn't met, and the person did it without no ability, you said the hajj is correct. And you guys are right, by the way, the hajj is correct if he does it. The reason is because the conditions are two types. The shart and the conditions in the religion is two types. The one that we mentioned for the salah is called shart siha. It's a condition of the acceptance of the prayer. Wudu is a what? It's a condition. But what type of condition? The condition of the prayer being accepted is based upon wudu. Shah. As for the ability for hajj, it's called shart wujub the condition of making it obligatory not whether it's right or wrong it's that it only becomes obligatory on you when you have the ability do you, do you am i making sense here so one one is one is called shartu siha the condition of acceptance and the second is called the condition of obligation does that does that make sense to, to each and every one of you so ability is shartu shartu in other words, if a person goes to the house of Allah with money that they borrowed from people and they struggle to get there, but they got there, their hajj is accepted and there's nothing wrong with it. But they didn't have to since they didn't have the ability. Are we all together? That's important. So here we're going to go into شروط وجوب الحج شرط وجوب The condition that makes Hajj obligatory And Anas رضي الله تعالى عنه Anas said قال قيل يا رسول الله It was sent to the Prophet Oh Messenger of Allah ما السبيل What is the path? What is the way? What is the means? For Hajj What's the ability for Hajj? The Messenger said two things الزاد والراحلة Provision and the means to get there. The person have the money, and that money means what? What does it constitute? What is it referring to? It means money that you have when you get there, and also what? The family that you left behind. This hadith, Daraqutni narrated it, Hakim authenticated it, Al Imam. Ibn Hajar, he said, وَالْرَاجِحُ إِرْسَالُهُ That this hadith, what is correct, it's that it's mursal. 
and it is Mursal. It's Mursalul. It's a Mursal of Hassan al Basri. It's Hassan al Basri's Mursal. In other words, Hassan al Basri, who's a Tabi'i, who never saw the Prophet, he attributed it to the Prophet. Anas ibn Malik, you, you guys are seeing his name here, right? So you're saying, no, the companion is mentioned. That's a wham, that's a mistake. Okay, it's not. After detailed look at the scholars of hadith, they realize that this hadith comes from Hassan al Basri to the Messenger. And Hassan al Basri, the marasil, the, there are many marasil. I have to remember this, brothers. There are many marasil. Marasil means when I, a tabi'i, the student of a companion who never saw the Prophet, says that the Prophet said. He's not allowed to say that. He has to tell us who he heard it from, who heard from the Prophet. Because we know you never met the Prophet, O oh, Tabi'i. I will tell that. Hassan al Basri never met the Prophet. Okay, he never met the Prophet. So it's a mursal, it's rejected until he tells us who he heard it from. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he said, the strongest type of mursal is Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, when he attributes it to the Prophet, it's the strongest one, even though Sa'id ibn al Musayyib never met the Prophet. Just like Hassan al-Basri didn't meet the Prophet. But Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab's mursal has more of a weight than the marasil of Hassan al-Basri. Why? Because Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, the majority of the people who he took from were the Sahabas. So if he does drop someone, generally he's dropping a companion out. Not only that, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab didn't take from everybody. Even from the tabi'in that he took from, which were little, he was, he handpicked them and chose them. Whereas Hassan al-Basri and Ata, Hassan al-Basri and also Ata, both of them, their marasil is very problematic because they narrate from any and everybody. And so when they drop someone out, there's chances where it could be someone who is not uh, good. So anyways, this hadith is mursal and it's weak. It is what? It is weak. It's not authentic. It is not authentic. And Imam Tirmidhi came, but he said this hadith has another, another way, another way, another way. Imam Tirmidhi. He said it has another chain. Okay, what's the other chain? He says, وَأَخْرَجَهُ تِرْمِذِيُّ مِنْ حَدِيثِ ibn Umar. The Anas ibn Malik, okay, you guys rejected it because it's mursal Hassan al-Basri. Okay, what about Ibn Umar's one? Ibn Umar's one. As for Ibn Umar's one, the scholars, they criticize Tirmidhi for authenticating this hadith and they mention that the statement of Tirmidhi is incorrect. Because in this chain is a man by the name of Ibrahim ibn Yazid al-Khuzi. Ibrahim ibn Yazid al-Khuzi, who is a weak person. He's matruk. His hadith is not taken. Anyways, all of this that Al Imam Al Ibn Hajar mentioned, the two hadith that he mentioned here are both weak. Both weak. So we're left with what? We're left with what does ability mean? That's the reason why he brought this, right? What does it mean? What does it mean from Sabila? Sabila. What does the word as sabil mean? What we say is the sabil means. One thing. It only means one thing. And that is the person has azad. Azad. Azad means the person has a provision. Money. The provision that we're talking about here is what? The provision that we're talking about here is what? Is that he's got money when he goes there. And he's also got money that he left for his family. Because it is a impermissible for a person to forsake those who has responsibility over. The Prophet said, Enough for a person, a sin is to forsake those who are under him. And he has the ability to provide for them. He has the ability to give to them. So a man has only little money. Either he goes hajj or he provides for his wife. He doesn't do hajj, he provides for his family. Are we all together? Also, he has to have provision when he gets there for himself. He's not allowed to beg the people. And he's not, allowed to, he's not allowed to ask the people. The evidence for that one is also 
وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ تَقْوَى Some of you might say, what is the delil, what's the watchful istilal from that ayah? How are you trying to stipulate a ruling from this hadith, uh, 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 from this ayah? How does it prove that when you get to your Mecca or you're on the way that you need to have provision? This ayah came down on a, of a, on a group of people from Yemen. It came down on a group of people from Yemen who went to Hajj and when they went Hajj, they said, Allah is going to provide for us. We don't have to worry. And they wouldn't take any provision. And when they end up coming to Mecca, they would beg the people. And they would ask the people. And so this ayah came down where Allah says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا Take your provision. Take provision with you. And then Allah told him the best of provision is which one like in? Taqwa. But because taqwa is the best of provision, that doesn't mean you don't what? You don't take provision with you. Go in there and then say, I'm just going to make it there, no problem. I don't care how I get there. When I get there, the Muslims over there are going to help me. No. A Muslim should take his provision and prepare himself. The concept that Islam propagates is what? Tie your camel and then rely on Allah. You tie your camel and then you rely on Allah. You don't just let your camel go and say, Inshallah Allah will protect it for me. Are we all together? And that's one of the reasons why brothers, people leave Islam when they see Muslims do that, who are not rational. They're not thinking straight. People start thinking, A'udhu Billah, these people don't make sense. Are we all together? So we have to show that Islam is a religion that goes hand in hand with what? The aql. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said, Laqiya, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa came across raqban bil rawha'i. The messenger came across readers in ar rawha Rawha is a place uh, in between Mecca and Medina. It's actually closer to Medina. It's close to Medina. But it's a path between Mecca and Medina. And the distance between it and Medina is 73 kilometers. Um, so the Messenger وسلم, came across them. فقال, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and he asked them, Man al qawmu? Who are you? The Messenger asked. Qalu, they said, Al Muslimuna were Muslims. We are, we are the Muslims. فَقَالُوا Then they said to him, مَنْ أَنْتَ هُوَ يُّ then? He said to them, رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I am the Messenger of Allah. صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَرَفَعَتْ إِلَيْهِ As soon as he said that, a woman, she picked up and lifted up a boy. فَرَفَعَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ صَبِيًّا A woman, she raised and she lifted up a boy. فَقَالَتْ She said, أَلِي هَذَا حَجٌ Is this boy, will he be rewarded for hajj? قَالَ نَعَمْ The messenger said, yes. وَلَكَ أَجْرٌ And you, the parent, the mother, you will be rewarded as well. This hadith, it is in sahih because it's, it's narrated in where? It's narrated in Sahih Muslim. This hadith shows that the young child, the baby, it is, his hajj is Sahih. The little baby's hajj is Sahih. Even if he's younger than the age of distinguishing, he doesn't know anything, no problem. 
Because look, it's, it's a baby she raised. The mother picked up the baby. So it's, it's, it's a child that can be picked up. Al-Imam Al-Tahawi, Abu Ja'far Al-Tahawi, he transmitted a consensus that the child, he will, reward, he will be rewarded for his hajj. The same way for his salah. But it's not obligatory on him. But if it's done, he will be rewarded for it. There's a companion by the name of Asa'ib ibn Yazid. He said, Hujjabi ma'a Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ana ibn sab'a sinina. Asa'ib ibn Yazid, and he said, My parents, my guardians, they made me do hajj with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I was only seven. So the child is rewarded. A lot of people have this concept which is the child doesn't get rewarded. The only person who gets rewarded is who? His parents. Is that common in the Indian culture? Hmm? They say that. They say the ajr is only for the parents, not the child. Uh, my country, they say the same. No, that's incorrect. The Messenger of Allah, what did he say to the hadith? When she asked him, Ali hadha hajjun. Will this young boy, will this, will this young child be rewarded? The Prophet said, Naam. And you get rewarded as well. Question. How do you reconcile between this, this hadith, and another hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, رُفِعَتِ القلم. أما رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامِ أما رُفِعَتِ القلم. The pen is raised, is lifted. From what? الصبي حتى يحتلم. The child. Until he reaches puberty, the pen is risen, it's high. So how can he get rewarded? How is there a reward written for him when the pen is lifted? Huh? The qalam is two types. Qalamul mu'akhada. Punishment. No, he's not punished. But reward is written. Isn't that Allah Taala very merciful? Very merciful. But that doesn't mean if a child destroys a, your neighbor's car, that you say, he's a kid, don't worry. He won't get punished for it. In Allah Azza wa there's no sins written for him between him and Allah, he's a kid. But there are things that he does to people, it has to be paid back. A majnoon, a crazy person from the family member, if he drives a car and he hits someone and he kills, he won't be killed. But blood money has to be paid. You can't say he's majnoon. How are we going to play blood, blood, blood money? The pen is lifted from him. The pen that's lifted from him is the pen between him and what? Allah. Allah will not punish him. So he's not reached that age. He's, not, he's a child, he's a kid, or he's insane. But we all together. Like in the rights of the people, that's another rights. So here, hajj, qalamul mu'akhada. The child will not be, sin won't be written for him. Like, and if he does any good, ajr. And the parent who endorsed it gets the ajr as well. Are we all together? So we need to encourage our children coming to the masjid. Teach them, nurture them. Because the child gets rewarded. He's getting a lot of reward. Even when he grows up, there's ajr for him. Stacking. And you get ajr for it as well. I see parents, subhanAllah, who have children. And in the UK, they have young kids. And they open them a savers account. They put money in there for their children. Nothing bad. They can do that if they want to. As long as there's no muharramat or anything haram being done. But there's nothing wrong with that. But what amazes me is why wouldn't you do the same when it comes to a ta'at, obedience? That at a young age you nurture your child to do good things, that it becomes a bank for him. Him coming to the masjid. Him coming to the hilaq, the circles of knowledge. Him going to you in places of khair. The kid gets rewarded for that. Before even he has to do it. So save us. Are we all together? People don't think like that. People don't think like that. But you have to think like that, brothers. Question. This young kid now, he's done hajj. And we just said he gets rewarded for it. The question here is, this hajj that he has done, هل تجزئ هذه الحج عن حجة الإسلام؟ 
Does it uplift from him the Hajj of Islam? So when he grows older, does he have to do Hajj again? So what was this Hajj? There are two views. There are what? Qawlan, two opinions. Al-awwal, the first opinion is Annaha la tujzi'u That it doesn't. It doesn't uh, suffice him. Meaning he has to come with another hajj when he reaches age of puberty. And this one is just a voluntary. It's just ajr. Good deeds. But the real one, only when he reaches age of puberty. That's the first view. That's the overwhelming majority of the scholars. Rather, Ibn Mundir and Ibn Abdul Bar, they transmitted a consensus in this issue, but like in their consensus, there's a look to it. Because there is a khilaf. We're all together. And that's why it's important that a student of knowledge verifies where there is an ijma' and where there isn't. When you just see in a book, Allah, when you see in a book, Ajma'a Ahlul Ilm, the scholars have unanimously agreed upon, go and research, is it true? Or is there a difference of opinion? The second opinion is, and Nasabiyya, the young kid, if he does Hajj before he reaches age of puberty, it will suffice him for him having to do Hajj after he reaches age of puberty. He doesn't have to. This is enough. There's that view that is out there. And Al Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, he transmitted it from a group of people. And Al Imam Qadir Iyad, he said, This is Shad. It's an unorthodox opinion. It's a what? It's a fringe. It's an obscure opinion. And they use this hadith. This, this hadith. To say that it suffices. Because the woman, she said, hajjun qala na'am. They said, the messenger said like that. What is correct is, the view of the Jumhur Ahl al-Ilm. The first view is the correct, correct view. The overwhelming majority of scholars, what they said, that the child has to do hajj again. What's the evidence for that? It's a hadith that's going to come to us soon, inshallah ta'ala. Hadith ibn Abbas. It's going to come to us in this chapter. We might even be, if we go fast, we might be able to do it here, inshallah ta'ala. Today's class. Good. This hadith shows if a person does tawaf, pay attention, fiqh in hadith. If a person is in tawaf, and he's got another person with him, like a child, carrying the child. And that child is doing Umrah with you, right? Or Hajj with you. The walking one, which is the mother or the father, and the child, this tawaf is enough for them. It's one, one tawaf they do together. That's the first opinion. That is the what? That is the first opinion, that the t- person who's doing tawaf, the mother or the father, and the child which they are carrying, their tawaf is together. And it's not necessary that the mother puts the child down, or she does seven, and then she does seven for her child again. It's not necessary. That's one view, that both of them can do it at one time together. And that opinion, this hadith is what they use for it. Because the woman she was doing tawaf when she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second opinion, and that first opinion is a view held by Shaykh Abdul Nasr Sa'di and Shaykh Ibn Baz, they held that opinion. That's enough. Both of them are good. The second opinion, which is everyone has to do it separately. Because they use the argument which is it requires a niyyah, intention. And a person cannot do an intention for another person. And the child doesn't have an intention, he's a young kid. So they said, sorry, a person can do an intention for another person, but a person can't do one act with two intentions for two different people at the same time. That's their argument. And that's the view held by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the first of you is strongest. The reason is because the statement of the hadith of the Prophet is general. And if it, if it gets restricted, it needs a delil. The other benefit that we can take from the hadith is the permissibility 
of women asking fatwa from a man who's a foreigner from her. She could call an imam and ask him a question on the phone. Or she can ask him face to face that it's permissible with the condition that she doesn't sweeten and soften her voice because of the ayah that she shouldn't speak in a soft manner where it could cause a fitna for the one whose heart is sick. So she shouldn't. But she is allowed to ask a question if she has it. Because of this woman, she asked her Prophet. Alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu um, نعم. وعنه قال كان الفضل بن عباس فقرديب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فجاءت امرأة من خطعة فجعل الفضل يصلو إليها وتنظر إليها وجعل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يصرف وجه الفضل إلى الشرق الآخر فقال يا رسول الله إن فريضة الله على عباده في الحج أدركت أبي this hadith speaks about the ruling of Hajj from a person who's physically unable. Physically what? Physically unable. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he said, Kan al Fadl ibn Abbas. Fadl ibn Abbas is the brother of who? Abdullah ibn Abbas, they were brothers. Fadl ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Abbas. They're both from the, they're from Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle. So Fadl ibn Abbas and Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abbas are the Prophet's first cousin. They're first cousins. Fadl ibn Abbas, he was a radif of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A radif means a raqib khalf al raqib. Two people are mounted on the same riding beast, both of them. Again, it shows the permissibility of two people being on a riding beast. Human rights, uh, animal rights, huh? No, it's permissible. As long as, of course, the animal is not little and the people are not big and there's no harm being directly caused to the animal, then it's permissible for two people to mount on the same, same riding beast. There was a story of a man, he was on the riding beast and his son. And so he went by the people and they said to him, this man should fear Allah, what is he doing? Does he not care about the animal? How selfish of him. And so he came down, him and his son. And the people, they said to, the, to him, how dim-witted is he? He has a riding beast. And he and his son are both walking on the earth. And so he went on the riding beast. And they said, how selfish is he that he will make his son walk whilst he enjoys himself on the riding beast. And then he went down and he put his son on the riding beast. And they said, what a disobedient child that is to be on the riding beast while his father's walking. The moral of the story is, Trying to please the people is a goal you're never going to reach. You're never going to be able to. Who should you please? Allah, Allah, the one who created the what? The one who created the creation. Alakulihal, the hadith shows the permissibility of what? Two people mounting on the right, same riding beast. Fajaat imra'atun, a woman came, and this woman was from the people of, she was Khath'ama. Khath'ama is a qabila qahtaniya. Qabila qahtaniya, a particular tribe who they, are, they reside in Ta'if. Uh, up to, in Saudi Arabia, ila abha. They are there. She said to the Prophet, فَجَعَلَ um, الْفَضْلُ يَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهَا Fadl was looking at her. What was Fadl? Fadl was looking at the woman. This noble companion. وَتَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهَا And she was looking at him. They were both looking at each other. وَجَعَلَ النَّبِيُّ The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم يَصْرِفُ وَجْهَ الْفَضْلِ He turned the face of Fadl. إِلَى الشَّقِ الْآخَرِ To the opposite direction, the other side. Some scholars, they took from this hadith and an evidence that the woman's face is not awrah. 
and that the niqab is not obligatory. Are you with me? They said, Fadl was looking at what? Of course, he's looking at her face. So she's not covered, her face is not covered. The scholars who believe that it's obligatory for the woman to cover her face, they gave two responses. They gave what? Two responses. The first response that they gave was, this is Hajj. And the Hajj, the women don't have to. They don't cover their faces and they don't cover their hands because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. In which he said, "La talbizil qufazaini." Don't wear two gloves. La tantaqibna. Don't wear niqab, and don't wear gloves on your hands. The women are not allowed to. So, Sheikh Nasir rahimahullah, he was of the opinion that it's not obligatory, right? He had a strong, valid point against the scholars of the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, because he said, even still, you guys can't get out of the discussion, which is. You guys still say that she has to what? They all agree that the niqab she doesn't have to wear. But you also still say, like Shaykh Uthaymin and others, they say that she has to still grab the side of her cloth and cover her face. Are we all together? He sort of said, so, so covering the face is still obligatory on you guys, according to you guys. Are we all together? So it's true for Shaykh Uthaymin and others, this is a tricky hadith. But they gave another response. They what? They gave another response. The response that they gave, they said, it doesn't necessarily mean that her face was uncovered. Most of your evidence. They said that the woman that came to the Prophet Sallallahu to see him, the woman that came to what? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she presented herself to the Prophet, she said, Ya Rasulullah, marry me. فَنَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا The Prophet looked at it. فَسَوَّبَ النَّظَرَ The Prophet looked up and he looked at down. Looked down. Pause. We all agree, he said, Sheikh Albani. Oh, sorry, the other group, they said, we all agree to Albani. We all agree that the woman's leg is what? Awra bittifaq. There's no difference of opinion on that, according to us. So when the Prophet looked up and down, if looking is that, that what you look at is always showing, then that means her leg was showing. And that's not correct. That's not true. Does that make sense? Another response for this particular hadith is an explanation Sheikh Abdullah ibn Salah al-Fawzan al gave. It is that he said, It could be possible that the messenger told her to wear hijab later. Could be a possibility. And then he goes, لِأَنَّ عَدَمُ نَقْلِ أَمْرِهِ لَا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ الْأَمْرِ إِذْ عَدَمُ النَّقْلِ لَيْسَ نَقْلَ لِلْعَدَمِ But to me that's not strong. Also, the, uh, for me, the woman when she goes hajj, she doesn't have to cover her face. Her face can show and her hands can show. And she doesn't have to do this. Because there's a particular hadith that says she doesn't have to cover her face. But once she comes out of hajj, the evidences that say that she has to cover her face is overwhelming, it's too much. It's too, too much. And it seems strong that she should cover her face. If the Sharia will tell her to cover her legs, then the face is more of a fitna than the, than the legs. Are we all together? So this hadith is a discussion on that issue. That's not what we're talking about here, but it's an issue that the scholars raise. And as, as I said, there is a valid difference of opinion. But one seems stronger to a person than the other. So Abdullah ibn Abbasin, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi sorry, Fadl ibn Abbasin, the Prophet moved his head, and she said to the Prophet, she said, "Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Inna farida Allah ala ibadhi fi al-hajj adrakat abi shaykhan kabira." She said that my father, Hajj has become obligatory on him. Question here. Hajj has become obligatory on my father. What does she mean that she, Hajj has become obligatory on my father? He has the provision, he has the money. But he doesn't have what? He hasn't got the physical ability to go there. Is Hajj still obligatory on him? 
إذن when we say and before I mention it but I left it for now that فمن استطاع إليه السبيل and only means money are we all together brothers Hajj is obligatory on anybody who's got money even if he can't get to Hajj even if he what can't get to Hajj why if you can't go to Hajj then you have to sponsor somebody else to do it on your behalf so it's still obligatory on you are we all together that's important Hajj is it is obligatory on the person who has the money, money. so she said Ya Rasulullah La yathbutu ala rahilati this man my father, sorry, he cannot stay on the riding beast. He can't, it's too hard for him. عنه, shall I do Hajj on his behalf? قال, the messenger said, Yes. And this was the year of the Hajj al Wada'. Meaning she's trying to say this was the last and last. No abrogation. No abrogation. Benefits that we take from the hadith, or some things that we take from the hadith, is an issue that some scholars mention I want to point out, which is okay, I am doing Hajj for someone. Okay, I'm going to do Hajj for someone. My father, for example, who lives in Medina, I'm going to do Hajj for him. Or a friend of mine, or whatever, it doesn't matter. He lives in Medina. What's his, we're going to come to it later. What is the Miqat of the people of Medina? The Hulayfa. Miqat means there's a place they need to go to before they go to Mecca. We all know that, right? We're going to take that in more details. Because I'm doing Hajj for a person who's in Medina, do I have to do it from the miqat of that person? Is that a good question? Yeah. Is that a good question? Do I have to go to the miqat of that particular person and do hajj from that person's miqat? Or can I just do it from wherever I live in the world? I live in, for instance, uh, Iraq, for example, and then that Tuqaran is my miqat. Why don't I just go that direction? Why do I have to go to his one? There are two views. The first view of scholars who said, no, because you're doing it for that person, you need to do it for their miqat, which is a view, weak view. It's a weak view. The second view is, you do it from wherever miqat that's easiest for you. Whatever miqat is yours on the, on the way. Whatever miqat is on the way. Why? Because the way you get to hajj is not maqsoodun li dhati, is not intended. Had what is intended is when the ihram starts onward. Are we all together? The way you get there is not maqsoodun li dhati, the way you get there. Whichever miqat you come to is not intended itself. Are we all together? What is intended is what, is, what starts after that. And he has the ability to do it. It's, no, it's permissible. Even though it's much, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether it's cheap and not, he doesn't even have the ability to do it, Aslan. He will never be able to do it. So it is permissible for him now. So he's going to choose somebody from Saudi Arabia to do it on his behalf. Sahih. In Saudi Arabia, it's permissible. Ja'is, it's permissible. Because again, as I said to you, the means is not maqsoodu li dhatihi. It is not intended in and within itself. What is intended is what's done after that. Okay? In, that's understood, I hope. Is that understood? Mm. Also, the hadith indicates jawazu hajj al mar'ati an al rajuli that a woman can do hajj on behalf of a man. Okay, and Islam again, when it comes to righteous actions, men and women are the same. They are the same. If a woman prays and a man prays, is the same. Are we all together? Like in biologically, men and women are not the same. Even the feminists agree to that. That's an ijma between us and them. صح? Like in ahkamu sharia, if both parties do a good act, 
it won't be looked at who did it, what gender did it. Are we all together? Does that make sense? Like in the ahkam of the sharia, what does he observe? Like Allah Taala made something obligatory on the men and he makes something obligatory on the women. What is Allah observing when he makes it obligatory on them? He observes the biological side of the man. And Allah also observes what? The biological side of the woman. So Allah will tell the woman, you can't fast in this time of the year, or you can't pray, or you can't, because Allah knows these, the women he has created. Salah, which is a big action, don't do it. Why? Allah creates and he chooses. Creates and chooses. Creates and chooses. Remember that. He created you in a way and he chooses the ruling that are fit for you. Does that make sense? Feminists don't like that. It's weird because they agree biologically that men and women are different, but they want the rules to be exactly the same. That's unjust. Zulm. How is that oppressive? Had the child and I can't eat the same food. Are we all together? If you give a burger to a newborn baby, take him to KFC over there, and you say, Zinga meal. Huh? So? Zinga box meal. That's the, that's the real one. And he chooses the spicy. And he eats the fries, and he eats the chicken, and he eats the burger. Is that, can, that, can the child do that? Huh? A tall man and a short man. You say to the short man, because you're both men in the same height. You're not the same height. Can you pick something up from a tall shelf? And the tall one, you just say, sit down, inshallah, relax. By requesting from the short one is oppression. Is Why are you doing that to the short one? Sah? But it's funny, with feminists, if you bring that example, they're going to say, are you comparing us to a newborn baby? Are we all together? I'm comparing the differences, I'm not comparing who's the baby and who isn't. Are we all together? I'm just comparing that it's the difference that's here. Are we all together? So the Sharia observes that. Like in a woman can do a hajj for a man, and a man can do a hajj for a woman. Because the woman here, the messenger affirmed it for her. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. The, the, another, another point that we can take from this hadith is, um, People can mount on the same mountain together. Uh, they can mount on the same riding beast together. I mentioned that. Also, what we take from this is the permissibility of the woman asking a man question and a man responding to the woman in what that question is, giving her an answer. The permissibility that it's allowed. And so this hadith shows that the woman's voice is not a... Aura. The woman's voice is not aura. The other benefit that we take from this hadith is staying away from, especially if you're, if you're a youth, mawaqi al fitan, the places of trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. Stay away from it. There are people who suffer from addiction. They watch haram things. Then get rid of whatever is pushing you to this haram thing. If it's a mobile phone you're using, if it's your laptop. If it's your gadgets, get rid of it. You have to stay at it. A person has to distance himself from what? Mawaqi al fitna. The things that are going to lead you to the fitna. What's the evidence for that? The Messenger of Allah is going to push Fadl ibn Abbas, his head, from the fitna that it can lead to. Are we all together? Well, Lidali can remember this. Everything and every disobedience starts from, a, starts from somewhere. It starts from somewhere and then it grows. It catches fire. There's a Somalian saying that stealing starts from touching. No one just walks into a bank and rubs the bank and brings an AK-47 in one day. He's never done it before. Are we all together? He doesn't. He has to first take his mom's chocolates from the pocket, the chewing gum. His mom and dad, you know, once he masters the house and he learns how to nitpick from the people's pockets that come into the house, finished. He moves into the neighbors and wahakada, tadarruj. He gets one star, two stars, three stars, sah? Until he becomes a general. Sah? Tahakada, tadarruj. 
the zina and the haram, they start from somewhere. No one just goes and does zina with someone. Where does it start from? Things that the person doesn't avoid. But well, I've said this many times, many times. Never think about bringing about good when there's evil already there. Get rid of the evil first. A person recently came up to me and said, I committed zina. I said, well, you don't have to tell me, just repent to Allah. But the point I want to get from the story is, everything you look around the person, it's like, stop, why are you doing this with this one? Okay, I'm addicted to this. Okay, stop this, stop this. He said, but I pray Salah, but I fast Mondays and Thursdays. That's good that you're doing. It's not, but you don't think about doing good when there is evil you need to prevent. That's the first thing that you need to do. al wiqayah to khayru min al-ilaj. Prevention takes precedence over cure. Are we all together? So get rid of those things. Stay away from those haram and get rid of it. The other benefit that we, had, we take from the hadith is looking at women. If there's no hajjah, there's no need for it. Just to look at a woman is haram. Why are you Jews? Are we all together? It is haram for a man to just look at a woman. Are we all together? There are times when it's permissible. If a person's buying and selling, this is permissible. There's a, there's a need for it. Or he wants to get married to her, it's allowed for him to see her. Like in just sitting on the road and just watching every woman that goes by, layer Jews. The Prophet said, Don't follow one look with the other. The first one is for you, but the second one is not yours. If you look, turn around. If you go and you look again, this time you're sinning. So the first time, Allah will forgive you because it was unintentional. Looking is a problem. It, this, the, the eyes and the ears and the mouth, don't think to yourself that it doesn't affect what's in the heart. It will affect what's in your heart. It's the channel to your heart. It is what? It is the channel to your heart. Another thing that we take from the hadith is the Prophet والسلام, how he didn't talk to the woman who looked at the boy, Fadl ibn Abbas. Who did he speak to? Who did he turn, turn away? He turned Fadl ibn Abbas. Are we all together? So, you're a man, a, a girl and a boy are looking at each other. You don't jump to the girl and say, sister, stop looking at the brother. Are we all together, brothers? The fiqh is to, 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 to do what? The fiqh is that you turn away the brother. Once you do that, what is that a lesson for? The opposite will understand. Okay. Another thing it shows you is if generally the concept of izalatul munkari bil yad, removing evil with the hand, generally applies on a person who has authority. That's general. That's the qa'idah kulli, general. If you see someone smoking, you can't just take a cigarette out of his mouth and throw it on the floor and step on it. What is he going to do? Everyone knows what the story is going to end with. Sah? I'm a one tabliqi man said, I saw a man smoking and I said to him, use your right hand. He was smoking with his left. I said to him, use your what? And I said to him, why did you say that to him? He said, when you stop the munkar, you have to do it to darruj. Step by step. <laughs> no. I said, what about if he was drinking alcohol? He went quiet. I said, well, don't you want to do it to darruj? So brothers, understand this. If you see somebody doing something haram and you have ability where they can't fight back with you and there's no bigger problem that can come from it then what do you do you can use your hand if you want to like your own child your own child you can stop physically something from him صح? you can if you can't then you move on to the what you talk to the person in a nice way you tell them if that doesn't work what do you do you hate it from, a heart, from your heart. That's what we take from the hadith as well. Now. Quickly go over this hadith as the last hadith الكريم, This hadith A woman from the people of Juhayna She came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And she said 
in ummi my mother nadarat nadarat means she made it obligatory on herself to do hajj then hajj only becomes obligatory in two situations or three situations three situations number one is if you've never done it before number two is if you make it obligatory on yourself you make another oh Allah, ya Allah, I'll do this I will do hajj this you make another with Allah Azza and the third one is in the shuru if you've already started the hajj you got into it those three situations you have to you have to do hajj if you were not it wasn't upon you to do hajj and you went to Ka'a Makkah and you just said you know what I might as well just do hajj this year I'm already here I came on a business I might as well do hajj so you went to the miqat and you did your hajj and halfway into hajj he said I'm tired I can't do hajj I'm gonna go back home no you have to complete it you started it you have to complete it and the second one is nether that's the second and the first one is the first one was if you've never done it before once in your lifetime hajj is obligatory so this woman she said that my mother she made a nether the prophet sallallahu said to her and my mother died she didn't do the hajj and she died can I do hajj on her behalf the message said yes do hajj on her behalf if your mother took money from someone she borrowed money from someone would you pay that money on her behalf the woman said yes I would I would then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said to her اقضلها. Then pay back Allah his rights. Allah is deserving for him to be paid back. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he is talking about a concept which the Usuliyin call Qiyas. The Prophet just done Qiyas here. Qiyas is an analogy. Which is that the Prophet compared taking money from someone to what? making a promise with Allah Azza wa Jalla that you're going to do a particular act. Both of them are debt. He compared the two. When the woman agreed to this one, by default she would have to agree to the other one. And this is where the scholars said, in the religion it's allowed to do qiyas. That we have a issue where the Sharia spoke about it, but then comes a contemporary issue which the Sharia hasn't spoken about. Like drugs, is it haram? What's the evidence? You can never bring a hadith or an ayah that says drugs is haram. So you're going to have to look back at alcohol and compare that with that. That's qiyas. Where did you, where did you find that qiyas can be done? From this hadith. Because the messenger did it. Alayhi salatu wasalam. He did it. Um, a point that I need to mention is, this hadith shows that if a person makes a covenant, an oath, to do hajj and he dies, before he can fulfill the promise, he dies what? before he can fulfill the promise. Then it's legislated for those who are under him to pay for him. But if he left behind money, he left behind money, there's money that's there. It be, it should, it's obligatory to be paid on. Someone has to pay that money on his behalf. Someone has to use that money to do the hajj for him. Because he left money behind, there's money there. Even if he doesn't leave it as a wasiya, even if he doesn't write it as a wasiya, it has to be done. What about if he never left no money behind? And I have to use my own money to pay for my mom's nether. I have to pay for it. She never left no money, no nothing behind. The Jumhurul Ulama are of the opinion that it's recommended for me to pay on my mother's behalf, that it's not obligatory. Are we all together? And the Zahiriya, they said, no, no, it's wajib. The Zahiriya, they said, they said it's wajib. And the refutation and the response to them is, if they say that it's obligatory for me to have to pay for my mother, even though she never left no money behind, and I now have to make money to go on behalf of my mother after I do my own one, and if I don't do it for my mother, because he's saying it's obligatory on me, right? I'm going to be a what? I'm going to be a sinner. And if I become a sinner, I'm becoming a sinner for what? For someone else's action that goes against the ayah, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَزِرَةٌ وَزِرَةٌ أُخْرَى no one is held account to the wrongdoing of another person. Are we all together? It goes against that ayah. And also this hadith, 
it was a response that the woman asked the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when she said, inna, inna ummi nadarat, my mother made a promise to do Hajj. But she didn't do Hajj and she died before she can do it. Can I do Hajj on her behalf? The Messenger said, Naam hujji anha. Yes, do Hajj on your mother's behalf. The woman, she said, ah, anha. Can I do Hajj on my mother's behalf? In other words, what she was saying was, if I do Hajj on her behalf, will it be accepted? Not that she was saying, is it obligatory for me to do Hajj on her behalf? Does that make sense? It's important. So then this dismantles the Zahiri, the zahiri evidence in totality because the hadith doesn't show uju aslan. It only shows, it only shows that, that it's legislated, that it's permissible for me to do Hajj on behalf of my mother. Another benefit that we take from the hadith is that the nether can take place, that it can happen. But with the condition that that nether that you made, brothers and sisters, it's a nether in which it is not disobedient to Allah Azza wa Jalla. If you're disobeying Allah Azza wa Jalla in the nether that you make, oh Allah, I will promise I'll beat that person up. You're not allowed to. But you still have to pay a kafara. But you don't fulfill that nether. The only nether that you are, you are forced to fulfill is that which is in obedience to Allah. Man nether an Allah fal Anyone who makes another to obey Allah, then he should obey Allah. But if anybody does another in disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jalla, he doesn't go through with it. But he comes with a he comes with a kafara. Well, ilm in Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I might have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.